Welcome to Disciple Dojo. I'm really excited about this episode. If you saw the previous video about my experience at SBL, you know that one of the people that I got to hang out with while I was there was Dr. J. Richard Middleton. Richard was great at literally taking me under his wing and showing me around and introducing me to people and connecting. And it just, it, it made all the difference in the world. I sat in two of his presentations at SBL and one of them was on Psalm 77. It was about 25 minutes. And I knew after listening to that presentation, there's way more than 25 minutes worth of stuff here. We need to bring him on to Disciple Dojo and let him walk through what he presented at SBL without the time limit. And so that's what we have today in this episode. We're going to do a deep dive on a fascinating psalm that you may have read before. You may have read it multiple times and just kind of glossed over it. After this episode, I don't think you're ever going to read this psalm the same way ever again. Before we jump into it, if you have not already subscribed, we would love for you to subscribe here at Disciple Dojo. We're so close to our goal of 5,000 subscribers by the end of 2022. We're almost there. You may actually be our 5,000th subscriber if you click subscribe as you're watching this. But that's a great way to support this channel. Every subscriber really helps us grow. And more than that, if you hit the notifications icon right there on YouTube, you can click the little bell. And what that does is that tells YouTube that you want to know when new content on this channel comes out. That helps us. That lets YouTube know that there's an audience for Disciple Dojo. And we are a fully donor funded nonprofit teaching ministry. So other than giving financially to Disciple Dojo, the best thing you can do to support this ministry is to subscribe, hit the notifications icon, like, comment, interact, share your opinions here on the channel. Just do the things that tells YouTube, hey, we like this channel and we're glad it's here. And as always, check out our Disciple Dojo online store over at Zazzle.com. If you like the shirt I'm wearing in this interview with Richard, this is the shirt based on the words of the prophet Micah. It's got the Hebrew text on and it's got the English overlaid. We've also got shirts for Greek nerds that have some English and Greek passages. Or we've just got gear for those of you that train and you're looking for things like rash guards or leggings or flip flops. We even got coffee mugs that help teach you the Bible while you're sipping your morning coffee or tea. So take a look over at the Dojo store. Anything you buy, again, helps support this ministry. And lastly, the biggest way to support us, honestly, is to become a monthly Dojo donor. Everything we do from our teaching ministry here to our outreach ministry, where we offer anti-bullying and self-defense classes to kids here in Charlotte from the local refugee, immigrant, or lower income communities that wouldn't otherwise be able to train jujitsu and to develop those skills of empowerment and confidence and discipline and the friendships that they make along the way, all the life-changing stuff that training in the martial arts can do for a kid. All of that is funded entirely by our dojo donors. So those of you that do donate, thank you so much. Those of you that are considering it, take a look at our website and see what you might be able to spare every month. You give us five bucks a month, you give us 500 bucks a month. Whatever God's blessed you with, whatever you feel this ministry is worth, we invite you to come alongside and partner with us financially. Okay, now that that's out of the way, enjoy this discussion with our good friend, Dr. J. Richard Middleton. Richard, it is great to see you again. Last time we were in Denver, and literally the last time I saw you, you were presenting uh, on your book, Abraham Silence, which we talked about the last time you were here. So viewers, if you haven't read Abraham Silence yet, you absolutely should, because it's a fantastic book and it was very well received, at least in the session that we were in. And there was some good discussion, but it is great to see you again. So tell just viewers who haven't been hanging out with you in Denver what you've been up to since the last time you were here or what you're currently working on. Um, just give us a little quick fill in of what, what's going on in Richard's world. Well, uh, thank you, Jay. I'm so good to see you again. And it's great to connect at SBL. It was wonderful to hang out with you. Uh, I've been teaching my courses. I teach a course on Christian worldview called Being in the Story. Mm -hmm. And I teach an exegesis course on First Samuel. I'm currently working on a book on that topic, but I had to put the book down while teaching. I'm going to get back to it in February or so, or January maybe. Um, I'm looking at 
the struggles between the prophet Samuel and Saul, the first king, and God, and they're all not on the same page. Mm. And I'm looking at the the dynamics of power and what we can learn about the ethics of leadership, because I think Samuel does a pretty bad job of mentoring Saul into power because he's threatened by him. Mm. So it's a book on the ethics um, of pastoral leadership, but other kinds of leadership too, that arises from close reading of scripture. Um, I'm always trying to do close reading of scripture for the implications for human life, and usually in the process, challenging traditional views while I'm at it. It's just for fun, you know? <laughs> <laughs> scripture has a way of doing that. It has a closely yeah. reading scripture has a way of challenging a lot of things that mm-hmm. we think we've uh, always known about God right. or humanity, Israel. I will be interested when that comes out because before I before COVID shut down our, our weekly Bible study that I used to lead, we had we were about to start first Samuel and spend a year teaching through Samuel and then COVID happened and the restaurant closed down. And so I let me know when your work is starting to get towards being published, or if you need somebody to kick some stuff by, because I'm happy to dig into that. It's I'm not as versed in the historical narratives as I am in Torah. So I'm always looking for to increase my own learning. (laughs) Well, we're going to switch gears completely from historical narrative in this discussion. And we're going to talk about Hebrew poetry. That's that's why I brought you here. I sat through two of your presentations at SBL, one on Abraham Silence, but the one that I was m- more intrigued by, and I think it was because I was more familiar with Abraham Silence and the discussions that we've had about that, I was less familiar with your presentation on Psalm 77 in the Hebrew poetry session at SBL. So, when you were presenting it, it was, there were about four or five presentations during that meeting, that session, and some were fairly interesting. Some were, they were tough to get through. Uh, and it had to do with what we're going to talk about, which is presenting something and how you present something. But your presentation, before we even talk about the subject matter, for those who don't know at SBL, papers are presented. And sometimes that means that they're presented and and talked about almost like a TED talk, so to speak. Sometimes papers are literally the person stands up at the podium and they just read their paper exactly as it's written. And those can be rough. Not going to lie. Those can be rough. So how is it that your presentations are so engaging when you're presenting your papers? So I read my paper verbatim as I wrote it. But I wrote it for oral presentation. That's the mm. fundamental difference. And I not only just wrote it for oral presentation, I presented it expressively, making the kinds of emphasis that one ought to make. I mean, I, I when I preach in church, I preach from a manuscript I've written, and people tell me they don't realize I'm actually reading a manuscript. Because it's how you present it. First is how you write it, and then it's how you present it which is really crucial. You can't do, you have to break up your long complicated sentences into short simple oral sentences and then you have to talk as if you're talking to children. If mm. children can't understand you, adults won't understand you either. <laughs> I've said and you can tell me if you think this is fair. I've said before if you for most things, whether it's the Bible or quantum physics, if you can't at least explain the big idea to a 9-year-old, I question how well you actually understand the subject. Um, what 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 do you now? Everybody might not agree with that, but that's just kind of my rule of thumb. But what do you in your mind when you're preparing? Because you were preparing to speak to a room of scholars, but yet your presentation, anyone could have listened and understood what you were saying. What's in your mind when you're preparing a paper to be presented? How does how does that work? Uh, like. How do you actually do that? So that's a good question. Uh, and I put it this way. Um, I will take the same material I, I do at a workshop for my church and present it at SBL. And there's only 5% difference in the mm-hmm. language. Um, because I may put a few things in that are technical for SBL. So the, the nine-year-old may not understand it. And right. I don't think every single person in the audience would get every single thing I say. But they, they it won't. what they don't understand won't detract from them following the basic um, you know, stuff. But the way I put it is this. I don't want to dumb down anything in church. And I don't want to separate the experiential side of life from academia when I'm presenting at SBL. For me, they both have to go together. 
the intellectual and the experiential are not two separate things. I have never experienced, and I've been an academic all my life, basically I've loved academics from the beginning. I've never experienced academia as an ivory tower. Hmm. Some people, that's the way they experience it. No, for me, everything I learned had immediate implications for my life. And if it didn't, I wasn't that interested in it. Why do you think so many people do make that distinction or at least have that understanding of academia being an ivory tower? That's a good question. I mean, it could be different reasons for different people. I think in some cases, people want to leave behind what they think is a naive kind of faith to get something more rigorous. And so they, they, they look with disdain upon their past. Some like you have a conversion experience and you told, I, I, I'm no longer that person. I'm somebody radically new. Of course, later on in life, you come and you re, re, reintegrate some of your early life back into that. But initially you have a kind of a distancing. I think some people in academia have experienced academics that way, maybe because they wanted to get something more substantial than what they learned originally, but also because in many academic institutions, not all, you are disciplined to experience life that way. You know, Michael Foucault, the postmodern philosopher, has a book called Discipline and Punish about the, the prison system, but it's applicable to the academic disciplines also. You are shaped, structured, formed by this system that tells you this is the way you must be. Well, I, I rebelled against that from the beginning. I was a campus minister teaching the Bible. Mm -hmm. studying and learning, sort of like you, you know, not, not an academic institution, doing my own thing. I come to do my PhD work and they tell me I must do this and that. I said, no, I don't want to do that. That's not the way I do life. <laughs> life cannot be separated from academia. I'm sorry. And, and I pushed back quite a bit on my dissertation supervisor. That's great to hear. I'm sure. <laughs> I, do you think a lot of people, do you think more people want to push back but are afraid to or are concerned yeah, so about... Yes, I got a couple couple emails after this Psalm 77 paper from two people I know, one an established New Testament scholar, one a new Old Testament scholar. You actually know one of them. I won't mention names. So. And they both said, you gave me permission to be safe as a woman, bringing my experience into academia by what you did, by what you modeled. It is very rare in academia. Well, good. That's good. I'm not even thinking that's the reason I'm doing it. I'm doing it because I have to do that. That's, you know, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. And this is the gospel for me. Right. It's it, for, for those who don't know about SBL, SBL is not a, a Christian organization. It, it's not everybody there is not preachers or even believers. There's people that are Buddhist scholars. There's people that are atheist, biblical scholars or religious scholars. There's you can't assume that the room you're presenting to shares even the basics of your belief system. So how, how does that factor in when you're presenting a paper that has very specific theological implications and, and you're sharing, which we'll get into when we look at this Psalm, but you're sharing what the Psalm means to you in, in terms of how it impacts you. What does your prep, preparation, is it different? in that regard, or do you take into account the fact that you're going to be talking to people who don't even share your basic worldview? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, most likely people who come to a biblical study session are broadly in the Jewish or Christian tradition, whether they take the faith personally or not, mm -hmm. and whether they separate their faith from their academics or not. So I don't think too much about the interreligious aspect of it when I'm doing a paper like this, but I am aware that, um, I will almost never say the name Yahweh mm -hmm. in a group. Now, I, many Jewish scholars I know say they've got no problem in an academic setting saying the name Yahweh. But you notice I said Hashem. Mm -hmm. I didn't say Yahweh, right? Or even Adonai. I, I would put some synonym in there for that, just to be sensitive to that, to that, con to that context. That's interesting. Yeah, some people may not even be aware that that's an issue, but for especially for, I guess, for Orthodox Jews, that's a big no-no. Not for all Jews by any means. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, presenting versus reading is an issue that I think it's really important for Christians to understand, especially people in church and especially pastors, pastors who are watching this, who have to preach every week, but not just pastors, even lay people. Sometimes you get called to read scripture and especially, you know, we're in the season of Advent. There are scriptural Advent readings all the time. I remember as a kid growing up, our family would light the Advent candle and we'd have a read a section of scripture. And 
I'm going to tell you, listening to somebody read scripture sometimes can be like fingernails on a chalkboard because it is, there, there's no engagement. There's, it's almost like the person reading it doesn't even know what they're reading. They've just been handed something and they're reading it. So what are some tips and some pointers, whether it's presenting an academic paper or whether it's reading scripture, either way, you're working from a manuscript, you're presenting information to an audience. What are some ways that people watching this who may have to read something in front of their church sometime, how do you make it not be painful? How do you make it be interesting and engaging and reflect what the writers of the text were feeling when they were writing it? So one of the issues is you're not always sure what the writer was feeling or thinking when you write, when you read it. So you got to try different ways, expressing different things, emphasizing different things, but always think that there's a little child in front of you. You're going to read to the child. When you read a children's story, you don't read in a monitor. Say, now, once upon a time, there was a giant who lived up in the hills. You're going to read with some expression. Right. So, for example, um, 1 Samuel 17, the David and Goliath story. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not? A, no. He shouted, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come. You know, I actually read that text like that in scripture, uh -huh. in, in church, <laughs> because that's the way you got to read it. And then the armies were shaken in their boots when they heard that. You got to make that sense come through, whether it's a narrative or it's a bit of poetry. The most difficult things to read are Pauline epistles. Because they're long, complicated sentences. You have to decide what it means, what the emphases are. Slow it down. Pause between each phrase to, for emphasis. You have to learn to practice that. Try it out different ways. Have somebody listen to you and say, I didn't understand what you meant by that. Can you read it differently? I think in Protestant settings, especially, uh, maybe not as much Catholic Orthodox or, or high church mainline, but in, in, in lower church Protestant settings, I think there's a tendency to think that all the expression and all the, the, the communication is going to happen in the sermon. So anything up to the sermon is just, we just reading it because we have to, or, or reading it to get it out of the way. Now the preacher is going to come and tell us what it really means. And we miss, I think, the main thrust of God's word when it, it replaces God's word with the sermon. And so the sermon becomes the authoritative word instead of the scripture itself being the authoritative word. I've wondered sometimes whether in Protestant, you know, lower church settings, if it might be a good idea, I, I think it is a good idea, but I've yet to see somebody do it, to have services similar, I guess, to maybe what in various Jewish traditions have happened, where you have people who are professional at reading the text and they're reading long sections of the text, almost presenting them as if you're listening to an audio book. Uh, how do you, what are some things that you think? I mean, that's just one example that I've had in my head, but how, what do you think we can incorporate scripture into churches more audibly in a better way? So by the way, there is a, a form of Jesuit service that's simply reading scripture. Oh, um, and, and no disrespect to my Jewish brothers and sisters, but I've been in Jewish services when Jewish readers are reading English, they read expressively. When they read Hebrew, they do not. <laughs> they read super speed. Mm. So because they've memorized it. Mm. And th that can be a problem too. <laughs> so er every tradition has its own problems. Mm. Yeah. The, what I tell, when I was training scripture readers, right? It, but it, the reason I started training scripture readers is I said, first of all, we have to have a part in the service where we're going to read scripture. The scripture goes with the sermon, and sometimes the pastor or the preacher wouldn't even read the scripture. They would just start preaching and mention it along the way. It's listed in the bulletin. So I said, we have to have a place where we read the scripture prior to the sermon, maybe before another hymn that intervenes. But I told my scripture readers, I want you to be able to read the scripture so well that they don't need a sermon. I love that. That's not I always possible. That. But if you <laughs> aim for that, that, that's the goal, I think. Yeah. That's I, I love that because... I mean, you and I know the, the Bible, most, most people throughout most of the history of both Testaments didn't have their own Bible. And sitting and reading silently is a very new thing in the history of Christendom. You, you heard scripture for most of the history of God's people. And, and it's almost like today that is unheard of. 
in many churches is scripture reading. As you go, you find your quiet time, you get your coffee, you sit down, you read your Bible, you meditate on it, you pray. And I know of people who've never heard scripture read out loud with any form of expression. I mean, you know, the, the, the Jewish Hebrew text, right, before the Masoretes put the vowels in was just consonants. Mm -hmm. You can't read that silently. You have to sound it out to figure out what the vowels are. And you may sound it wrong the first time because there may be different words that have different vowels, but the same consonants. Uh -huh. so you have to try it out. <laughs> That's what makes you... <laughs> <laughs> That's what makes Hebrew so maddening for people that yeah. are first learning it, is yeah. not having the vowels. <laughs> when I was in Israel, uh, a, a young soldier, she was probably like 19 at the airport. She was kind of teasing me because I was telling her, I was like, I need vowels. I'm lost with all these signs. Like, I need to know what the vowels are. And she was laughing. She's like, oh, we forget those when we're like five years old. <laughs> and so it, it, there's there's a disconnect between scripture as it's presented in the text and how most people read it obviously and it's because of inflection it's because of expression it's because of you know some people just aren't trained don't grow up reading out loud there there's an art form to it but there's another challenge and this one faces a lot of readers that is the challenge of reading poetry and in general so i grew up you know studying english ap english I hated poetry. Like I, I hated having to read poetry in high school because I would sit down and people talk about, you know, like Robert Frost or Walt Whitman or some of these poets of giant stature throughout history. And I would read the work and it, I might as well have been reading cuneiform or hieroglyphics. It just made no sense to me. And when I started learning biblical Hebrew, and I started really kind of digging into the Hebrew poetry sections in the Bible. It actually helped me appreciate English poetry a little bit better. I still can't say I love poetry. I still can't say I read poetry nearly as much as most people do. But I have an appreciation for it that came from reading it in Scripture. I want to hear because I know you you have more of an appreciation for poetry than I do. I can already just from your musical background and and culturally, I think poetry is much closer to I think it resonates with your heart more. At least it certainly did when you were presenting on Psalm 77. So I would like you to tell me and anybody who's watching this how to get stuff out of Hebrew poetry, how to get the most out of poetry in the Bible. It's similar to how to get anything out of poetry anywhere. Um, you So you're right. A lot of poetry, if you just read it silently, you don't know what it means. You have to read poetry out loud and try out its meaning and emphasize different things. And sometimes it'll still be obscure to you, right? But sometimes the meaning will come. And sometimes it's because of the sounds of the words. Um, did you know that Ray Bradbury, you know, the famous science fiction writer, has a, has a book of poetry? Some amazing poetry. And sometimes his poems are three, four pages long. They're too long, in my opinion. But he plays with sounds, um, assonance and dissonance and resonance. And it's beautiful when you read it out loud. And sometimes you have to try it, certainly with the Bible, and read the thing out loud and try to understand what is the emotion the poet is going through. What, is, what do they mean by this point? Even if it's a stereotypical language. Many Psalms use the same phrases. You know, it, it's like this reservoir of terminology that psalmists draw upon part of their worldview mm -hmm. but how they're using it in their particular case and what they mean by it you have to try out different expressions different emotions different stresses to say what do i think is the the sense that the psalmist is going through the sense of the words it's experimentation but but it like basically in, in all oral reading the, what you're trying to do is to understand the meaning and then convey the meaning by the way you read it. Mm -hmm. So the way to get to the meaning of poetry is to try to read it different ways and see what you get from it. You mentioned, you talk about, you know, sometimes you have to try out different ways because poetry by its nature sometimes is multivalent or, or ambiguous. How do you safeguard against reading just kind of whatever you want to read into the text? Let me, let me answer that by asking a parallel question. How do you know that somebody loves you? I mean, they give you lots of money and gifts. 
<laughs> and if they have no money or gifts so, well clearly they don't love you obviously no, no. <laughs> so no no it's I, a similar kind of question there uh -huh. is no proof there is no you know you can't reach this limited now i know what this text says exactly you, you have, this is where i'm at right now i may be corrected later on i may change my mind i've changed my mind about the meanings of texts mm -hmm. um when new information comes to you, new contexts come to you, and you, new insights come to you, new experiences come to you, and you see things differently. But at this moment, this makes sense of the text for me. So the way I, for example, divided up Psalm 77 in three units, thinking the psalmist is going through these experiences, you will not find all commentaries agreeing with that. They have different ways of thinking about what the psalmist meant. So am I just being obstreperous and going my own route? <laughs> Or do I think this makes best sense to me right now? So I'm going to put it out there. Mm -hmm. But my psychological certainty that this makes sense to me, this is what the psalm means, always comes with a parenthesis of epistemological humility. I may be wrong. And I'm willing to listen to somebody telling me that doesn't make sense. Try this one. Oh, okay. But right now, I don't have doubts. I think this is what the psalm means. And I'm going to stake my life on it right now. But I may change my mind later on. That's the way I deal with truth claims, mm -hmm. because having studied philosophy, I know you can't absolutely get to any final truth that you know for sure with beyond any doubt, epistemologically. Psychologically, you may not have doubts, but you could always be wrong. So you need to leave that open for the possibility of being corrected. Mm. How then, at the follow I'm imagining the questions that people would have listening along to this, especially if they come from a traditional uh, or maybe an apologetics background, the objection would be something like, well, but Richard, then how do we know anything is true about a psalm? Where, how can we have any certainty that I can stake my life on this if, if I'm also saying, but I could be wrong about it? Where, how do you hold that balance? I'm not going to stake my life on the meaning of a psalm. I'll stake my life on the resurrection of Jesus. But even that, I'm not going to be able to prove, <laughs> contrary to most apologetics. I mean, I wrote an apologetics paper as an undergrad proving the resurrection. I look at it now and it doesn't prove anything. It's within my own framework that makes sense. So for me, proof, the most proof you can have is faith-seeking understanding. Mm -hmm. You start with a particular position that makes sense to you. And you say, let me try and understand why I believe that, what the implications are. So I'm not just believing it naively. But at some level, I stake my life on this is where I stand. I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the incarnate word, raised from the dead, died for our sins, coming again to renew the creation. Can I prove that? No, but I'm going to live my life as if it's true, because I do believe it's true. And this proof in the, in the rationalistic sense never works. Mm -hmm. I could tell stories about people I know who were apologists, apologists who I try to tell them, you really haven't been able to prove what you think you can prove. And they came to the point later in their life where they realized they couldn't prove it. And so guess what? They became agnostics because hmm. they tied too much to the idea of proof. I think that's a false God, actually. I have a philosopher professor. He was an agnostic Jew when I was a grad student. He said, people asked him, why does he believe what he believes? He said, because my mother told me. <laughs> That's in other, the, in other words, testimony is the yeah. ground for all other knowledge. I was going to say that's every mom's favorite answer right off the bat. <laughs> <laughs> but he dedicated 11 books to his Jewish mother <laughs> that he wrote. <laughs> he really meant that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, but I think I think that does get at something which everybody needs to grasp, which is we all believe a lot of things based on authority. Um, everything I believe about any field that I'm not versed in is believed on authority. I have no proof of, you know, quantum mechanics or, uh, you know, astronomical things related to stuff that scientists have seen in telescopes and calculate. I wouldn't even begin to know how to evaluate that in terms of if it's true or not. And so I, at the end of the day, have to say, all right, I'm going to believe you because you've studied this and you know where do we end up getting stuck with that as christians to say well i'm going to believe based on somebody else's authority you're not stuck with it you have received the deposit of the apostolic tradition it's been passed down through jesus and the apostles and the church and that doesn't mean that every version that you've received is fully accurate but the church has passed down to me the truth and i believe that 
And I will question all kinds of aspects of the tradition. I challenge Augustine on his Neoplatonism and I challenge Aquinas on doctrine of divine simplicity and so on. But you know what? These are the people who testify to this tradition has given me a significant meaning to my life. And I'm in that church. I'm going to deconstruct the things that don't make sense. I'm going to try to find a core tradition that's really helpful and authentic. Mm -hmm. And each of us needs to go through that process. Nobody actually accepts everything that's given to them, but nobody proves everything from in our Cartesian blank slate <laughs> to, to say this, I can establish everything based on methodical doubt or something. It doesn't really happen. Yeah. And the testimony is first, and then you clarify the testimony by serious thinking and by communal discussions with other people who you trust. Mm. You had a good point on Facebook the other day about deconstruction. And you said along the lines that people deconstruct, but then they don't reconstruct. They some, just some deconstruct don't, for yeah, the sake yeah. of breaking stuff down. So well, what what are yeah. what do you think people should be doing? Because I it seems you think, and I think I would agree that, that deconstruction is a necessary, healthy thing to break free from uh, received faith, blindly received faith. Yeah, yeah. But how do you do that? Or what are some ways people can do, people who get nervous about that? Because they see all of the Christian celebrities in the past three or four years that have left the faith because of their supposed deconstruction. Yeah. And they're like, well, I, I don't want to go down that route. So yeah. what do you what do you encourage students to do if they're coming to you with these kind of questions? Before I answer that, let me just mention, this connects perfectly because this is a psalmist who's gone through deconstruction. Mm -hmm. And the psalm is about how he comes back to reconstruct something. And what's really crucial in the psalm is he comes to reconstruct because he indwells the larger communal narrative of Israel's story, what God has done. And nobody who just deconstructs the artificial, unhelpful version of theology they received can just do that on their own and come to something more helpful. You have to be part of a community of faith. You have to find a church that worships God in a way that makes sense. That's an alternative to the narrow-mindedness you experienced before. If you don't find the community, you're going to be set adrift as an isolated individual. And you, you can basically make up your own faith and become totally subjectivistic. And that's not helpful. So I've always found being deeply connected to Christian community while you're doing deconstruction is radically important. Otherwise, you'll just lose your way. That's a great, that's a great piece of insight for people watching because we are in a culture, in American culture that is fiercely individualistic. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, I mean, how many, how often do you hear the phrase, I did my research. And usually that means I watched a video on YouTube that tells right. me what I want to hear, <laughs> yeah. but there's this even left, right, both it's, I've looked at it. I've studied it, I've read it, and now I know. And it's it's I, 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 and you rarely ever hear the we, you know, we right. believe. And that's a great point. I just want viewers to make sure you're hearing what Richard's saying on this, is deconstruction isn't the problem. It's, it's not siloing yourself off and coming up with your own meaning, yeah. but rather, you know, bouncing stuff off of people and, and listening to others yeah. and weighing, weighing things individualism and human autonomy is the problem. Thinking that we're a law to ourselves, that we can make up our own faith. No, no we can't. Mm -hmm. um, every tradition in the history of the world, whether Christian or, or some other religion or some other culture, even tribal cultures, always have some idea there is a universal truth that when you comport yourself properly towards that truth, you find meaning in life. Modernity and the postmodern condition is the first time in the world people said, I am a law to myself. I don't need some larger truth. I can construct my own reality. When Plato mentioned that the sophists claim that man is the measure of all things, he mocked it and said, what a stupid idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How can a human being be the measure of all things? Now we actually believe that. Mm -hmm. that that's the, and Christians have absorbed, they've been socialized into that kind of culture. And that's where you have the celebrity culture that when, when they crash, they got nowhere else to go because they've never been subordinate to a, the, the discipline of a community that says, um, I'm simply one part of the body of Christ. I bring my contribution. I got no problem with saying I, but saying I doesn't solve the problem. Right. It doesn't, doesn't justify my beliefs. I have researched it. Fine. Now, what did you find? Explain it. 
talk about it. Let's have a discussion. So, you know, as a student in class, I haven't done this for a while, but I used to say this in undergrad classes. They'll say, I believe so and so and so. I say, I don't care what you believe, I tell them. I want to know why you believe it. Mm. <laughs> yeah, we all believe different things. Let's process why we have come to this belief, where we got the idea, what are the implications of the idea? How does this idea relate to the other ideas that we have? How, let's process that together. Mm-hmm. So no one is an island. That is so crucial. It is so crucial. That's part of well, one of the courses that we, it, shameless plug, but we don't have any sponsors. So I'm going to use this as a sponsor. One of the courses <laughs> at Disciple Dojo that we developed and, and taught in churches is called To Know and Be Known, Forming a Thoughtful Christian Sexual Ethic. And the tagline of this course is, this is not a course on what to think about sex. This is a course on how to think about sex in light of what scripture and Christian tradition has handed down to us. But it, it's it's exactly what you're talking about. People, they they just, a lot of times they just want to know what to believe. Just tell me what to believe. Or they react vehemently against that and say, oh, well, you, if you told me what to believe, I'm not going to believe it because you told me to believe it. And the truth is, in between those extremes is is listening in community, learn, hearing an idea and being willing to hold it with loose hands, and 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 you know twist it around and look at it from different perspectives, and being okay saying no, this doesn't convince me, and letting it go, or saying yeah, actually I find this compelling. I'm gonna I'm gonna hold on to this, and that's a challenge. In, I mean, whether you're talking about sexuality, whether you're talking about politics, whether you're talking about COVID vaccine research, or any of the hot button issues, there's there's this, it, it's like a constant tug between those two forces of just do what you're told, or I'm not going to do anything I'm told. And you got to, I, I think your work is uh, some of the best out there at holding that balance, which is why I appreciate it so much, because you don't, you don't gravitate to one extreme, you, you kind of rejoice in both the, the I and the we. But not everybody can do that. And my humorous point would be that, you know, I have been challenging people in churches and my courses for years and, and saying things that they thought, well, where does this come from? I've never heard this before. I've never been, never, ever been accused of being a heretic. Well, you need never. to do more YouTube videos because I get accused of being a heretic all the time. Well, but, so. well actually, on, on Facebook, I do. On Facebook, people don't know me, right? They don't know me. They don't know how I'm grounded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think if it's done well, I, I, yeah, I think you're, there's no reason for anybody to ever throw that label out if somebody's doing what you're doing, which is listening, presenting, weighing, discerning, you know, just because you entertain a different, like your Abraham silence, you know, you, you take a, a different position from what is commonly taught about the Abraham Isaac incident, but it's not like it's just, oh, well, let me do this to be an iconoclast or let me do this just to get published. Let me, you know, you're, for those who read the book, you see what Richard does is he goes, hey, there's stuff in the text that if you're reading the text closely, you're getting clues and hints that the traditional way this text gets presented is not the sum total of what's going on here. And I, I think that was really helpful, whether or not somebody's ultimately persuaded by your arguments or not, they can't help but respect the arguments, which is what I was hearing in the session where people were responding and reacting to the book at SBL. Even the ones who weren't persuaded were still incredibly appreciative of, of the journey you were taking them on in the book. Let's look at Psalm 77. We've danced around, we've talked about poetry, but let's look at some actual poetry. So what I'm going to do on the right hand of your screen, this is Richard's translation of Psalm 77 that he's going to be walking us through. And I have the Hebrew on the left here, just to keep him honest. Uh, and then, but also on the far left, there's for those who may have seen this in the in IV, um, that's usually the most widely translated, used translation among at least Disciple Dojo viewers. But I just have this up here as just the way you can see how the text is handled. But I've asked Richard to come on and walk us through this psalm in a more expanded version and a not as rushed version as he did at his SBL meeting, because I thought it was fantastic and I wanted him to share it. 
So Richard, you just walk us through Psalm 77 and, and how to get anything from it. How about if I start by reading a few verses, reading the first stanza as I as I think of it? Is that what that makes sense? Perfect. And I'll follow um, along with you on the right hand of the screen. Okay. Um, how about you want me to read the Hebrew as well as the English or just the English? Uh, if you want to, if, if the Hebrew, if you think there's something to be gained by the sound, by all means, I think people would enjoy hearing it. I'll do that for at least, the, the, you know, verses two through two and three of the Hebrew, which would be verses uh, one and two of the English. I'll do that. Okay. So they have a, you have a superscription, which says, um, for the leader upon Jeduthun for Asaf, a psalm. But after that, I'm going to get to the core of the psalm. Koli el Elohim va'etzacha. Koli el Elohim va'ha'azin elai. Beyom sarati Adonai darashti. Yadi laila nigra velotafug. Me'ena chinachem nafshi. Eskara Elohim va'ehemaya. Asiha va'etzitatef ruhi. Selah. All right. My voice to God, Elohim, I cry out. My voice to God, that he may listen to me. In the day of my distress, I saw the Lord, Adonai. My hand at night has been stretched out without wearying. My soul refused to be comforted. And verse 3 is like a really important verse here. I shall remember God and I shall complain. I shall meditate though my spirit faints. Sila. Though we don't quite know what sila means, but it's a pause. So this is a psalm that moves through three sections, three stages that the psalmist's experience of darkness. And so what, we've, what I've just read to you is, this, is the first stage. What's crucial about this is that at each stage, particular verbs are used. The verbs remember and meditate. In Hebrew, that's um, zakar for remember and siach for meditate. So the psalmist basically says at the beginning, I shall cry out. And I have in my translation, I emphasize that. That's a form of Hebrew that we call a cohortative. Now, it's not a standard statement that says, I will cry out, and a, a statement of fact. It is a statement of intent. I shall cry out from the verb um, uh, to, to call out or to cry. It means I am going to do it. I plan to do it. It's the same form of, of um, expression you find in the Bible in the plural when God says, let us create humans in our image. The let us make or may it be so. It's an affirmation of intent or desire. So you almost need to have an exclamation point there. And this psalm is full of verbs that emphasize the psalmist's desire and purpose. So he's, what he says in the first few verses is that he has been praying for a while. And while he's been praying, he's found no sustenance, no comfort. He had his hand stretched out at night without wearying. He's been calling out to God, but he gets no answer. And he, de he determines in verse 3 of the English... I shall remember God. I'm going to focus on God. I'm going to bring him to mind. I'm going to complain. And that's an interesting word, I shall complain, which is also uh, cohortative. And it means something like, I will make a lot of noise. I will roar or groan. Mm -hmm. So complain is a good translation for that. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to meditate, even though my spirit faints. I, I'm going to, I get weary doing this, but I want to cry out to God and be heard. Now, if people are reading this, I'm, I'm just looking over at the NIV and the NIV English verse three is they translate it as a past tense. I remembered you, God, and I groaned. But in Hebrew, it's it's imperfect. And do you do you have any under, idea why they might have or in other translations might render this as a past so, tense? So Hebrew has two general tenses, the perfect and the imperfect. Perfect means that the, 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 usually it means that the, the, the action is done. Mm -hmm. So it's often past tense. Imperfect means the action is not completed yet. So it could be present. It could be future. It could be repetitive in the past, iterative, they call it, or it could be volative, having to do with the will, what I want. In this case, it's what I want. It's got a particular form. It has a concluding um, 
basically comments hey at the end of it, which, which mm-hmm. means it is not a statement of fact, it is a statement of intent. However, it is well known by biblical scholars that when you go to Hebrew poetry, you can't always follow the tenses very technically. It doesn't always work. In this poem, however, I think the perfect tenses all refer to past and the imperfect, which are usually in the cohortative, all refer to future or intentionality. Mm-hmm. That makes sense to the whole psalm. It doesn't always work for every psalm, but another scholar who follows this way of parsing of the tenses in his translation is John Goldingay. Mm-hmm. In his translation and in his commentary on the psalms, um, I find that he agrees with me pretty much, or maybe I agree with him because he's a much more prominent scholar of the psalms than I am. <laughs> Well, I, the reason I bring this up is because some of our Disciple Dojo viewers do either know a little bit of Hebrew or are in the process of learning Hebrew. And this is something that a first year Hebrew student would look at this and go, well, this is clearly imperfect. So it's not, a, you know, it's not past tense, but yet NIV and others may render it past tense. So the point worth noting for those maybe a little more, let's say Bible brown belts, Bible black belts in terms of the languages, or those those who are trying to get there is you in poetry, like Richard said, yeah, poetry can be maddening, because the tenses don't always fit what you learned in Hebrew one or two. And having to have that ambiguity there is for some people, it's maddening. And for some people, it's exhilarating. Which side do you fall on? Do you find it more exhilarating or more maddening? I tell you, Hebrew poetry can be very difficult to translate. So what scholars tell you is if you learn Hebrew from a grammar in an introductory course, you have learned Hebrew prose. You have not learned Hebrew poetry. That is a, almost like a different language. So Hebrew prose tends to use the simplest terminology, the simplest words. Like say so the word for bird is of, which can mean it's actually the modern modern word for chicken in, in modern Hebrew. So um, of Hashemayim, the birds of the heavens, standard word used in prose. You come to poetry and you find lots of other words like sephor, which is a very technical word for birds because poets love to take this, use multiple words words that are synonyms that they want to keep repeating themselves, right? right. Uh, the book of Job uses, I think it's six different words for lions <laughs> in mm-hmm. its poetry. So you get a, a whole new vocabulary when you come to Hebrew poetry that you don't always have. The syntax can be strange. They call it asyndeton, which means you don't have linking syntactical connections between sentences or phrases. You just have it thrown together. Mm-hmm. And so uh, this psalm was not the most difficult to translate. Psalm 23 is a very easy psalm to translate for Hebrew. But psalm 49, I couldn't make head or tail of Psalm 49 without a, <laughs> looking at m- multiple translations and even then figuring out, why did they render it this way? This sentence makes absolutely no sense. Mm-hmm. It's like reading some modern poet in English who's just spewing out words and you don't know what he's talking about. So it can be very maddening. Mm-hmm. But in this case, if I was to take the word for remember, he remembered in the past that it would be Zakar. Mm-hmm. Now, Ezkor would be, I remember or I, sh- I will remember as a statement of fact of the imperfect. But we don't have Ezkor. We have Eskara, which means I'm really going to remember. That ending is very specific. It's a cohortative. Mm. So there's, that's no, a, there's, no, there's no getting around that. That's a, this is a good reason why we encourage viewers in Disciple Dojo, do not read one English translation. Uh, you can have one as your kind of your base, but when you're studying the text, like we're doing with this psalm, ha- if you don't have Hebrew and you don't have the ability to read Hebrew, have at least three different translations from different ends of the spectrum. And you'll see instances like this where they don't agree. And then that will alert you that maybe there's something going on here. Students who don't have Hebrew always compare two, most likely three translations. Make sure they're not similar, like you know, um, ESV and NIV. That's too similar. The, the JPS translation, look at Robert Alter's translation, mm-hmm. uh, and, and then you know a more modern translation, and, and compare them. And when you find a disagreement, don't simply say, "I like that one better." Right. That is totally subjectivistic. <laughs> you got to go to a commentary and find out. Why do they disagree? What is going on there? Mm-hmm. And, and look at the rationales and see what makes sense to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
So let's this first section of the poem, then let's let's jump back to kind of the more white belt, blue belt level of understanding is uh, give us a quick overview before we move on. What's happening as this poem opens? So the psalmist starts by saying, I have been crying out to God, I've been raising my voice to God in my distress and seeking the Lord all night long. I've been staying up at night doing this, but I've got no comfort from it. Hmm. And then in verse three, he says, I'm not going to just ignore God. I'm going to focus on God. I'm going to remember God. I'm going to think about God, meditate on God. Even if my spirit will lag and I run out of energy, I'm not going to give up on God. That's what this first stanza really says. Mm. So it, rem it remembers the past and then affirms, I'm not going to give up. That uh, I shall complain as you've rendered it, which or, or you noted that word can mean groan or rumble or roar. Uh, NIV has groaned. But what's the importance of doing that? We, you know, because pe people get taught all the time in churches, hey, don't complain and all things give thanks. You know, be joyful. Uh, you have to tell your soul, my soul rejoice. God doesn't want to hear your complaining. That doesn't do any good. How does this psalm inform that kind of theology? But this psalm, like many psalms, uh, has the same basic point that Jesus makes in his teaching about prayer. He gives two parables about prayer, right? The importunate widow who badgers the judge till she gets what she needs, and that's prayer. <laughs> that's uh, petitionary prayer. And then you have intercess intercessory prayer where you, the friend at midnight wakes up a friend to get food to serve a, a visitor, a guest that he has. And Jesus, right after that parable, says, so ask and you shall receive. Knock and the door will be open. Keep asking because your heavenly Father wants to give you good things. The dominant teaching on prayer in the Bible is actually not praise. It is petition. Mm. Come to God and say, I need this, Lord. That's not demeaning. That's not less than praise. In fact, what you're saying is, God, I can't survive without you. So I need you. So a lament prayer like this, I complain to God. I'm saying, God, my situation is terrible. I need your help. That is a, a confession of dependence upon God. And that is the dominant stream of prayer in the Bible. Thanksgiving comes when you have been heard by God, and you can give thanks for having called on God and, and then be heard. A praise is a generalization from thanksgiving. To say, thank you, Lord, for that. You're always good to me. But then you forget the fact that there were times when you had to call on God to be good because life wasn't going well. You know, Jesus from the cross cried out, oh, Lord. All is well and all shall be well. No, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Using a lament psalm. So there's nothing wrong with this. This is, a, this is actually much more biblical, if you're going to pray, than just outright praise or thanksgiving. And you can go to Thessalonians and talk about, you know, pray without ceasing and always, everything, give thanks. But you go and read what Paul says in Thessalonians. And he actually talks about bringing what your needs to God, placing them before the throne and asking God for help. That's also there. Mm -hmm. So you can't do praise without petition. Mm -hmm. And you can't do petition without complaint, which is a description of why you need help. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us grow up with the acts of prayer, adoration, conf adoration confession, thanksgiving, and then at the end, supplication. And it seems like a lot of times in the Psalms, especially, that it's almost the reverse of that. That's right. That's right. Interesting. Look at stirring the pot already, and we're not even three verses in. <laughs> Let's move on then uh, to the next section. And you can, if you want to just read it in uh, English, that's fine. All right. Yeah. You grasped my eyelids. I was troubled and could not speak. I considered the former days, years of long ago. I shall remember my song in the night. With my heart, I shall meditate and my spirit will search. So it's night mm -hmm. and he still can't sleep, but he's going to focus now on the good times in the past. Perhaps when he went to the temple and he participated in communal songs of praise with the other believers, he's decided now to search his memory for the good times in the hope of finding comfort. But as you can tell from verse seven following, it doesn't work. <laughs> His searching and his meditation, his remembering, and he goes to the same two verbs, right? Eskara, I shall remember, and Asicha, I shall meditate. This only plunges him deeper into distress. Because when he reflects upon the good old days, it leads to a greater awareness of the immense gulf, the yawning chasm between the then and now. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. So in this case, memory raises troubling questions for the psalmist. Mm. This this is this section is profound for a lot of reasons. One of them, I suffer from insomnia. Uh, I take medication to help me sleep. Uh, there are people that have never wrestled with insomnia. There are few things m- that create more of a sense of despair and anxiety than not being able to sleep. There was a movie called Insomnia, Al Pacino and Robin Williams, Hilary Swank, back probably 10 or 15 years ago. And okay. there's a scene where Robin Williams' character, who's a serial killer, is describing insomnia to Al Pacino, who's dealing with insomnia. And it's one of the most powerful scenes of any movie I've ever seen because he talks about that dead of the night, you know, everything's still except you and your mind and this and that. And insomnia can be just a brutal experience. Some people just think, oh, what's the big deal? You stay awake. But there's something to it. And and when I read this passage, that was what grabbed me because he doesn't say, uh, NIV says, you kept my eyes from closing. That's not what it says in Hebrew poetically. This is another case where I, I'm not bashing the NIV. I use it regularly. I teach from it, but it does not capture the poetry of this section. What is what is the image that he says in? He says, you grasp the, the gates of my eyes. That's literally what he says. Yeah, uh, you can yeah. see it right here. You yeah. grasped, seized. And it's not and it's not even eyelids, it's literally the gates of my eyes. Like you you pull the gates open so they can't close, you know. Mm-hmm. Now, just through ambiguity of poetry, there are some translations and commentaries that interpret that to mean that you shut my eyes. Oh, interesting. You grasp them to shut it, so I couldn't keep my eyes open. Huh. But I so the picture I have, <laughs> this is this is gonna date me. This is I picture the scene in the in a Clockwork Orange by Stanley Kubrick, uh-huh. where this guy is being tortured. His eyes are being kept open. Uh huh. You know? Do, do you know that? Scene? It's that yes, I know exactly scene. what you're talking about. I think of that scene when I read this. Yeah. There's a a, a newer show that came out on Netflix a few years ago called Bird Box, and it was the same concept that they, the guy would. There's a famous scene. He's holding the person's eyes open because if you saw it, you would die, or you would go crazy or something. But yeah, the same concept. I I. That would be strange if it if grasping meant closing in this instance. I, I don't know. I, maybe that's one of those ambiguous things like you pointed out, but just it seems like this is not someone who is sleeping. Yes, uh, so. Well, there's one other thing I wanted to ask you, and this is minor. This is just um, I noticed it uh, in when he says in, in the Hebrew verse six, um, I shall remember, da, da, da. I shall, where is it? I consider it the former days. And it uses that phrase, Mekedim. Uh, uh, Mekedim. And this this is an interesting phrase because it, it can have ambiguity because in Genesis, it's actually translated as to the east or eastward. Or from the east. Or from the yeah. east. Yeah. And I've, when I, my first thought when I was reading way back through Genesis was God planted a garden and I just, when I saw Maketum, I knew that that can also mean from long ago or in, in the elder days. And it made me wonder if that was in Genesis, if there was some intentionality in, in that, that the phrase from the East also means in olden days or days gone by. And Eden is all about a, you know, primordial story. But, but when, but when they, um, they leave the garden and they go Eastward and then yeah. the people in Babel, are traveling Mekedam. And is that they're going further east away from the garden or are they trying to get back to the garden? That's where mm-hmm. the ambiguity is really interesting. Hmm. Uh, so, I, but, but, you're, but it also can be a temporal reference because the east is where the sun rises. And the, the, way, the way that Hebrew looks at it is that you're facing the west and the east is behind you temporally. So the east is in the past and the west is the future. So if I want to say the future, I sometimes say, um, well, yeah. I sometimes say Yam. Mm. So Yam is the Mediterranean Sea. That's sea. That, that means west, right? Mm. And Safon can mean north because Safon is a mountain up in the north where Baal was supposed to be, right? And then Negev is in the south. So these geographical terms can be directional terms. And in this case, it can also be a temporal term. Mm-hmm. And notice that Mekedam is parallel in the next line with Olamim, the plural of Olam, eternity. And the blog post I just posted this morning <laughs> was about the meaning of this term eternity 
that olam just means from the the distant past or the distant future mm -hmm. and so it's it's in this case it's, it's temporal right i remember when i was i was a student of walter kaiser and he in a class he talked about olam because people ask questions they said well how can the covenant be a covenant forever because the new covenant right. specifically abrogate and he said that he, he, his advice was think of Olam from the root of the verb meaning hidden or to hide. And the idea being it's so far, it's hidden. It's, it's, you can't see it's over the horizon. It's, it's as far as you can see. It doesn't mean it's what we would philosophically say forever, right? Right. but it's, it's just on past the horizon. And that to me, I don't know if, you know, it's one way of thinking about it. Uh, I know people always have different disagreements on the grammar or vocabulary or words mm -hmm. in word imagery but that made intuitive sense to me in how what you see in hebrew bible which is not a lot of philosophical axiomatic you know discussions right. but you see like you talked about grounded geographically based experientially based terms right. used to describe those kind of things yeah so in this section then this person they remember the song in the night, my heart shall meditate, my spirit will search. So that's what they're deciding to do. And then what what do we what happens next? So as the spirit searches, what the spirit finds is that the spirit has questions. Hmm. Will the Lord reject forever and no longer show favor? Because what they find is God seems to have rejected him. He used to accept him in the past, he used to show favor, and now he doesn't experience God's favor. Has his chesed, his steadfast love, ceased forever? Is his word permanently over-ended? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger stifled compassion? So it raises rhetorical questions. Now, in the um, lament psalms, many of them raise rhetorical questions to God, like, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Mm -hmm. That's a rhetorical question. It doesn't really want an answer. It wants you to say, stop abandoning me. Come and take care of me now, right? Mm -hmm. But this psalm is raises rhetorical questions to himself, wondering what has happened? Why has God's favor, God's word, God's promises, perhaps, what his word might mean, God's love, or God's grace, God's compassion, why has that stopped? What's going on? And as I pointed out when I did the presentation, that last line, im kafetz ba'af rachamav, has he in anger, stifled compassion, literally means, if he has an anger, stifle his compassion, dot, 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 he breaks off the sentence as if he doesn't know what to say next. And I could imagine him saying, then what shall I do? Or mm. as I mentioned, he might be a little more abrasive, might be thinking WTF. You know? <laughs> what are you doing in this situation, God? <laughs> so you're taking, those are the following in the Hebrew. Um, you're taking im. As not has he in his well, you're getting the has he in his anger stifled his compassion from that beginning. Hey, I, I, I'm, I'm beginning. translating it. I'm translating it as a question there, though, even though it's literally not a question in Hebrew. Right, literally in Hebrew, yeah. it, it would read woodenly. Literally, uh, he forgot compassion. God. Uh, it, it's the first part of an if-then statement. So, you know, it, it would be called the the apodosis. You know, uh -huh. Which one is the apodosis, which is the prodosis? I forget. Probably the prodosis. It prodosis is it, first. If, thing. Yeah, so he's saying, if he's in anger, stifled in compassion, then what? And this reminds me of um, sometimes in the Hebrew Bible, when you have a curse being uttered, the curse is in the form of an if. It doesn't actually exp exp explain the curse. It's, if this is the case, and then they stop because they don't want to say what would happen, the negative thing that would happen. Right. Like when a parent says, if you don't get over here right now. Yes. Yeah. And That's they leave pretty it pretty common in Hebrew Bible with curses. You don't actually state what the curse actually is. You, it's implied something bad will happen. Mm -hmm. And it's and, like that, I think. Yeah. Because I'm looking at this Hebrew. I'm looking at the M. M is right there. If. And there's no then. Yeah. After yeah. it, it doesn't end with it. Usually in Hebrew, it'd be if such and such, then, and I believe it'd be as or as, uh, yeah, could would be. be then let this happen. But yeah, you're right. Literally, it's just an if he in his anger has stifled his compassion. Dot, yeah, dot. I like the dot, dot, dot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Fascinating. Uh, comment on Samuel. So we talked about Samuel at the beginning. Mm-hmm. There is one, one particular point where Samuel in chapter 12 is giving us a speech critiquing the monarchy after <laughs> Saul has already been made king. Uh-huh. And he gets the people to admit the monarchy was a bad idea. So what, what you know, chance of Saul succeeding <laughs> would ever come from that? But fascinatingly, he gives a choice about if you um, go against the Lord, he's going to judge you. But if you follow the Lord, and he dot, 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 hmm. he leaves off the end of a positive statement because Samuel cannot think there will be any positive outcome now that they have a king. Hmm. So he does the opposite rhetorically of what you normally find in the Hebrew Bible. And again, I point this out in the, in the book I'm working on. Interesting. He, he can't countenance a positive consequence. Right. It's almost like he didn't happen. Yeah. He, he, I yeah. can't even give you an example of what that yeah. would be like because yeah. it's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. That's that. See, this is the kind of stuff that people I, you hear people say sometimes, well, if you want to if you read something in the original language, then it brings out this, this and this. And and a lot of times there's a pushback against that because it sounds like elitism, like, oh, you're saying that I can't if I don't read Hebrew, I can't understand the Bible. And I, I hope people that are watching this are seeing it's not a question of not being able to understand the passage. It is a question of the more you know the language that the text is written in, the more you see in the passage. It's not like you're not able to arrive at any of this meaning without knowing Greek or Hebrew. But when you do know Hebrew, it helps draw things out that you may miss if you're just reading an English translation. I see you have three levels of understanding. The primary level is you can know enough to know God to know Jesus Christ and be saved with minimal understanding, even of the English. If you compare English translations, you can learn a huge amount, Mm -hmm. almost as much as you get if you knew Hebrew, but not quite. Mm -hmm. But even if you learn the the original languages, you still have to think about it because syntax and grammar alone does not solve the meaning of a text. Once you know the syntax and grammar, you have the possibilities of meaning. Mm -hmm. Then you have to look at the whole context. What is the whole thing saying? How does this bit of grammar help me understand the flow of the entire text. And and context is actually as important, if not more important than the individual lexemes. Mm. That's a great, that's a needed word, especially for beginning language students, because the stereotype of beginning language students is like my Greek professor after our first full year, after Greek two, he said, congratulations, you now know enough Greek to start your own cult. (laughs) (laughs) that's good so that's not what richard's doing here and that's not what i'm intending to do here um but yeah there is a huge benefit in knowing the like you do i like how you said that you get you can assess the possibilities but it doesn't mean that you have the understanding of those possibilities then you have to have that enter into discussion and like what we're doing we right now we're reading scripture out loud and we're discussing it this is the essence of bible study i think it's in this case it's one-on-one and we're not at the sense of now, what does this passage mean to you just yet? Because we're still at the, what did this mean to him? Um, let, okay, let's then, where do we stop off? Verse. Oh, yeah, so we have, we're going to do verse 10 now, which is a kind of a transitional verse. Um, I have it as the conclusion of, of part two, the first, uh-huh. second movement. Uh, and I say, this is my pain. The right hand of the most high has changed. Now, couple of linguistic things about this. Um, this is my pain, that word for pain, chloti, my pain, gets translated in lots of different ways. My fault, even in the JPS translation. But I don't think that makes sense. It can be my wound. This is what's, what's gone wrong, that is hurting me. Mm. And the right hand of the Lord has changed. The word for changed, shenot, is either an infinitive of the verb to change or a plural of the noun for year. So some translations say, my years at the right hand of most high, that's my pain. Mm. In other words, my memory of the good years is what's causing me pain. This may be one of those places where the word is a double entendre. Mm-hmm. It can go both ways. Um, my memory of the good old days has caused my pain and because God seems to have changed towards me. So one word gets that years and change together. And um, I think NIV does years. Yes. And NIV like said, the new NIV at 2011 says, uh, then I thought to this will I appeal the years when the most high stretched out his right hand. 
Uh, so that's tell a, me, that's tell a, me that's how very, you differ. Well, that's a very expansive translation. First of all, there's nothing about stretch. You know, it just says either it's going to be um, the the right hand of the Most High has changed, or the ye- years at the right hand of the Most High. Mm-hmm. Those are the, the two literal translations. But to this will I appeal, I don't know how that gets at the Hebrew in any way. I'd have to go look at what is the rationale, why they would translate it that way. Uh-huh. They're, they're probably, they may be using context, not syntax at all. Mm-hmm. And I would want to be closer to the syntax to get my context right. So I think the psalmist is saying, given the context of what we've just read, all his troubling questions, he says, this is the problem I have. God seems to be different now. And I don't know what to do with that. And that's the core issue for me of the whole psalm. He is in deep distress because God, who at one time seemed to have been showing him grace and favor, has abandoned him. And he's in the darkness now and can't even sleep. Mm. So the, so however you translate it, I think that's the, the core point. Mm-hmm. Um, probably that verse, verse 10, if you look at all the different translations out there, you'll see the most variation for that one verse. Of, the, of this psalm, there's the of most. the entire difference. psalm, yes. Yeah. That, yeah. That'd be an interesting for viewers watching this. Pull up a Bible Gateway or a yeah. U version or something and just compare how all of the ones have handled it and then see what they say. I actually, I actually made up a handout with all the variations and classified them according to um, their interpretations for my students, you know. Yeah. Now, this, this is, let me, let me point this out in, in English verse 10. This seems to be a case of the the psalmist theology is rubbing up against orthodox or biblical theology in the sense that, you know, we're always taught God doesn't change. Uh, You know, God doesn't change. God's the same yesterday, today and forever, even though it's about Jesus. So what's going on? How can how can the right hand of God change if that's your translation? Me? Yeah. No, sorry. Yes. Yes. Doctor Dr. Middleton. Yeah. Yeah. So th- there is a point again in Samuel in chapter fifteen of First Samuel, the, the chapter where Samuel critiques Saul, and Saul is rejected from being king. Now Samuel speaks in God's name. Whether God gave the command that Samuel disobeyed, when Saul disobeyed, is unclear. But Saul took it as God's command, and so he is therefore rejected from being king. So. At near the beginning of the chapter, God says to Samuel, I have repented, Naham, changed my mind about Saul being king. The narrator ends the chapter, but the Lord, Naham, changed his mind, repented as a King James of being king. Samuel says in the middle of the chapter, the Lord is not a human being that he would ever change his mind. So you know that Samuel and God are not on the same um, page, right? Walter Moberly, brilliant Old Testament scholar, writing a, an article in that chapter says, it's interesting what Samuel says here, because this is actually contradicting the dominant trend in the Old Testament where the verb Naham is used for God over and over and over again. God keeps on changing his mind. And what's going on there? God is not immutable or unchangeable, except in his character. He is faithful and trustworthy. And therefore, he will consistently be changing and adapting to new situations as his people rebel against him or try to serve him or in different contexts need him. So you can imagine that. Let's think of two things. Let's think of a marriage and think of a family. You get married to someone and you you think you know that person, right? When you first meet them. Ten years later, neither of you are the same people. You have both changed. For the marriage to survive, you have to adapt to the new person. Mutual adaptation. And that will require actually a form of suffering. Mm -hmm. Because you have to give up on some of the ideals you had of the person to match the truth of who that person really is at this point. And for me, I've been married a long, long time. It's coming up 45 years. So this person that I married is not the same person anymore. I've had to constantly change. To be faithful, I have to change. If I have a child who then grows up and rebels against me, and I keep in contact with that child, keep in relationship with that child as he's an adult, maybe going into crime or drugs or whatever, and I'm keeping in contact, I have to keep adapting my relationship because I want to redeem that child. God, because he wants to redeem human beings who have fallen, is constantly changing his modus operandi in the world. 
up to the point where he becomes incarnate in the Jesus of Nazareth and goes to the cross for us. That's a radical change in God. He's no longer the same. As Os Guinness said in his first book, The Dust of Death, God was no Whitehall or Pentagon general giving commands from a distance. God is in the trenches with us. No other God has wounds. Mm. Well, God never had wounds before. God has wounds now. Mm. Because the reason Jesus even has a nail print still in his hands. So God has been changed. But why does God change? Because he's absolutely trustworthy and faithful. He never changes in his character. We've got to distinguish two different kinds of changes of God. So then, is this a case of the psalmist maybe saying more than he knows or better than he knows? Or is it he, only his circumstances are what make him think that God has changed? So, so let me um, make another comment. So I was, I was addressing the question that you were asking about how this rubs up against our traditional theologies mm -hmm. about God changing. The thing about the Psalms, especially lament Psalms, is this. Lament Psalms are not articulating theology. They're articulating experience. Mm. So an example of that, where the theology and the experience are together, is when it's either Habakkuk or Jeremiah, and I can't remember who said it, Lord, you are always right in everything that you do. That's theology. The next line says, but I got a bone to pick with you. Why do the righteous suffer <laughs> and the wicked prosper? Right. In other words, that's my experience. Mm -hmm. so, so when theology doesn't match experience, and that's what I think is going on here. Whatever the theology is, the theology is that God should be faithful and take care of his servants. But my experience is, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? The Bible, I think, gives us models to say, do not deny your experience to make it fit your theology. Don't give up your theology, but come to God and say, this is my experience, which doesn't matter what, matter what I believe. What is going on? Please help me. Because and that's what we call your, lament. That's what we call lament. You take the experience as veridical. It's a truth claim. It's real. It's not false. It's not the ultimate truth, but it is an important truth that you bring to God in prayer. So the speech act of prayer, in that speech act, you can say to God, as Jeremiah said in chapter 20, Lord, you have abused me and left me by the side of the road. But to write the book, as a Jewish scholar wrote, the abusing God, I find that problematic. Mm. Because systematic theology is a different speech act from prayer. But in prayer, I can come to you and say, why did you treat me that way? That was not good. I'm not going to go to all my friends and say, this person treated me bad. That's terrible. I'm not going to pronounce that as a general statement about you, but I may come to you and challenge you and say, why are you treating me this way? Mm. Why am I doing that? In the hope of reestablishing the relationship. There's a, there's a, we've, I mean, we've mentioned this before. There's a lot of Christians don't feel that permission to take these types of prayers to God. These types of prayers, they, they don't sound like our modern worship music. They don't sound like the cliches. They don't sound like Hallmark cards. Uh, but what they do sound like is what we all experience, which is the importance of it. Well, then let's move into the next section of the Psalm in verse 11. So what happens after he said, the right hand of the Most High has changed and that this is his pain, then what? So then he says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord, and the Lord is a short form of Yahweh, Yah. Hmm. Indeed, I shall remember your wonders of old. I will muse on all your work, and on your mighty deeds I shall meditate. First thing is the word remember in the first line is the, is the imperfect or the, the, the yiktol form of the verb. It just means, I will remember. But then comes the cohortative in the second line. Indeed, I shall remember your deeds of old. And this is now the, um, a radical shift. He's addressing God in the second person as you. And the rest of the psalm is a prayer from here on. There was only one other part earlier where he called God you. And that's when he said, you grasp the eyelids of my my eyelids, the gates of my eyes. Apart from that, it was a speaking about God in the third person. Now he's talking directly to God. And what you have in verses 11 and 12 is a deep commitment now to focus not on the despair, not on the good old days when things were going fine for me, but I'm going to focus on the mighty deeds of the Lord, your work, 
work is Pele. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love that, you know, because Pele is my favorite um, footballer, <laughs> e- e- even, <laughs> even before um, Messi and all these other ones. Because I saw Pele play when I was 15 in Jamaica. He, he scored a goal when his upside down flips, you know, and man, I can never forget that. Pele is my, my goal. Anyway, it means your mighty deeds or works. Uh-huh. So he uses a number of different terms for that. I'm going to focus on what you have done for Israel. So he begins to reflect on the communal narrative. He puts himself, he inhabits a bigger story. And when you inhabit a larger story, then you find meaning for life. And now he starts to speak to God. He says, your way, God, is holy. And most translations say something like, who is a God as great as our God? In the next line, he literally says, who is an El, the singular word for God, as great as Elohim? He doesn't even have our there, right? The me el gadol kelohim, who is a, who is a God as great as Elohim, the God of Israel. You are the God who does wonders. You manifested your strength among the peoples. With your arm, you redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. Mm. So here, here we have uh, intent to focus on what God has done, and he addresses God, and he uses ideas and words and language that come from the song at the Red Sea that Moses and Miriam sing in chapter 15. Mm-hmm. When they sing, you know, they, they, they use the word Yah, the short form. Um, let me see if I can, uh, I don't have that right in front of me. Yeah, in Exodus 15, 12, 2, Yah is my strength and my might, and he has become my salvation. So they're focusing on this God. And then the idea of who's a God as great as our God? Well, that echoes... Um, the, the incomparability of Yahweh at the Red Sea in verse 11. Who is like you, O Yahweh, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in splendor, doing wonders? And there are the words for holiness and wonders show up also in this section of the psalm. He's clearly drawing, at, drawing on the larger story, the poetic story in chapter 15 of Exodus of God parting the sea to bring his people to freedom. He's going to draw on that story, but he's going to transform that story in his own poetic way and make it even more interesting than Exodus 15 was. Now, I've noticed in the Psalms, in fact, I don't know of any exception, but I haven't done a deep dive on the Psalms in a long time. Almost every time when the psalmists talk about remembering God's deeds, almost every single time it is the Exodus. It's like that is the event par excellence. There's, yes. there's, it's like this, this is exhibit A in the type of saving God and, and God's wonders and everything where we, we tend to, in prayer, when people say, think about what God has done, we try to think, okay, what's God done in my life? Yes. Let me think about, you know, the times, that, but the psalmist rare, I mean, maybe sometimes they do that talking about singing songs in, in the temple of God and, you know, celebration at previous worship services. But the sense that I get, at least in my own reading, and you can tell me if it's off base or not, off base or not, is the remembering the things God has done for me in the psalmist mind almost always starts with the Exodus. That's probably true. I'd have to go look at that to see. Um, I'm not sure if that's the case with just with the verb for remember, but um, when they retell the story of Israel, and, and again, I have a chart I give to my students. But every time somebody in the Old Testament retells a story, they always have the Exodus and they enter to the Promised Land. They sometimes add to that Abraham and the um, the ancestors. Mm-hmm. They sometimes add to it certain other details, like the time in the wilderness or they might mention the plagues, or they might mention the Red Sea. Sometimes it's one or the other, sometimes it's both. But they remember the the corporate story. That's what they tend to summarize and tell. And then Paul, in Pisidian Antioch, actually does the same thing. He starts with the story, then he ends it with Jesus, who is a culmination of the story. And Stephen, in the speech when he gets stoned, is actually telling the story also and brings it up to Jesus, and that's why they get upset at him, right? Mm -hmm. So... Telling this large uh, narrative of what God has done for the people of God is essential to identity formation. We are people who are formed by the narratives we indwell. And so so many of us indwell the narratives of American um, exceptionalism or consumerism or individualism. And we do not counter that by indwelling the narratives of scripture. So this is a challenge to those who are pastors and are are worship leaders. 
let's not focus on songs about individual remembrance. Let's focus on the story of God that we become part of so that worship, corporate worship becomes a way of identity formation, that we become a people who live out the biblical story in God's world. But you know, most worship services don't do that. They're little devotional add-ons to the dominant story that has shaped us, and they don't challenge that story. Mm. I'll stop preaching on that, but that's really a important <laughs> point for me. You would be preaching to the choir on that one, because yeah. I could not agree more. Yeah, I, I absolutely. I, I think that that's something we've lost. It's one of the reasons that at Disciple Dojo and our Bible for the Rest of Us course, we begin by giving the big picture of the Bible, the big meta narrative, and showing uh, what Chris Wright calls the mission of God, what God's doing from beginning to end, and how you know these high points in that story, they have to be our identity. Because then we find our place in the story, and then we have a cohesive worldview that makes sense of where we are. And even when things don't match what they should be experiencing with what we are experiencing, but we have that story, it helps root us in that experience. It's often in chapel at my college, and I'm not going to miss college, my, my chapel, because it was a good, good experience. But sometimes you get a, you know, a song that we're singing together, and it talks about God and what God has done. But it doesn't actually say what he has done. It just talks about focusing on what God has done, but it doesn't tell us. It doesn't actually narrate the story. Yeah. Or the, the, the refrain in Psalm 136 is the core of a very beautiful worship song. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever. But the rest of that psalm is all telling the story, creation and exodus and all that stuff right to the promised land. And they never have that in these worship songs. They just use generic statements. But you ask the question, yeah, what? Has he done that proves he is good? And they don't talk about it. Mm. So our consciousness is not formed by the biblical narrative. Because I think, you know, what we sing shapes us much more than anything else we do in the Christian life. It shapes us much more than reading scripture. Absolutely. I and, mean, and I, can, I'm Methodist. I, you don't have to argue that on me. And, 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 it can, it can, and instead of forming us, it can actually deform us. Yes. The problem. That, well, that's one of the things when, when, when I... And, and I think your heart is the same way on this, is when when you're speaking against trends in contemporary worship or even historic worship, because that's not like every form of historic worship has been great. When you're speaking in trends of worship and critiquing them, it's not because you don't like worship or you don't think worship is important. It's because it's the opposite. It's because you know how important it is. Yeah, yeah. And you, you want to, you know, handle this gift as best we can. And I think I've met some and I know some good, good worship leaders who get it. They see themselves as leading people in corporate theology. And there's a night and day difference between a worship leader with that mindset and somebody who's just a good musician and likes to sing love songs to Jesus. It, it's night and day. Um and that's what we have in the psalm here, certainly, because this is not a love song to Jesus by any means, at least on the surface. It doesn't seem that way. And if you look at verse 15, right, which was the last verse I read, mm -hmm. you see this is a point of remembering the mighty acts of God because God acted to, quote, redeem his people, right? With your mm -hmm. arm, you redeemed your people, the children of the psalmist wants redemption. <laughs> he wants to participate in that. And this is actually an allusion to Exodus 15, verse 13. In your chesed, your steadfast love, you led the people whom you redeemed. You guided them by your strength to your holy abode. So he's alluding to this. That this story has a conclusion when the people come to the promised land and God dwells with them in the temple there. And the psalmist says, where is God? He's not here now. I want to dwell with God. Mm -hmm. So he tells a story for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Now, in verse in the next section, as, as we're segueing through, he's going to start to get in a, a lot of imagery that we've talked about here on the channel in our Bible background series. When looking at the imagery of the, the chaos serpent and the deep and the waters and um, God's lightning and his thunder and, and all of this that's pulling from the world, not just like one source, like the Baal cycle, but the whole milieu of the Baal cycle and Egyptian cosmology and and even I'm even I'm reading right now. I'm halfway through the Iliad, which I've never actually read the Iliad all the way through. But I'm astounded 
literally, I have notes in the margins of how much imagery and concepts from the Old Testament find their way in the world of the Iliad as well. It's like this was the air that the ancients breathed, these type of symbols and images. So your your take on this, I think at SBL was the reason, or I think that was the moment that I said, okay, I'm having Richard on Disciple Dojo for this, because the way you talked about this imagery and how it's used, I thought was absolutely brilliant. So walk us through this, this next part um, in the way that you did at SBL. So what we have is a vivid theophany, this dazzling poetic account of how God is manifest power and glory at the, the Red Sea, mm-hmm. just because the sea, right? And this, this image is going to go beyond the, the language and imagery of the Exodus 15 song of the sea, because in that song, and this is where this is a little different from the, the Baal stuff and the ancient Near Eastern backgrounds, the waters in Exodus 15 were actually God's instrument of judgment against Pharaoh, who functions as the cosmic serpent that needs to be defeated. Yeah. Like, just like in the plague stories too, God uses the forces of nature as his instrument to judge Egypt. There's actually stuff in Ezekiel that compares Pharaoh to the dragon in the Nile that mm-hmm. God is going to hook and pull out. So Pharaoh is the enemy. This, the waters are actually described in Exodus 15 as Mayim um, Adarim. And Adir is a term used of God at the beginning of that psalm. God is majestic in holiness. The waters are the majestic waters, sometimes mm. wrongly translated as the, 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 the mighty waters. That's in this psalm, not in Exodus 15. So he's going to take this, 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 this image of God and the waters, and he's going to transform it, Right. So here we have basically have a picture of a, of a violent storm. Verses 17, verse 16 following. The water saw you, God. The water saw you. They writhed. Indeed, the deeps quaked or trembled. The dark clouds poured out water. The clouds gave voice. That means thunder, right? Indeed, your arrows flew. That means lightning. The voice of your thunder was in the, the wheel. So whirlwind is probably a good translation for that. Lightnings lit up the world. The earth quaked and trembled. This is an amazing theophany, similar to the theophany at Mount Sinai and other places. Booms of thunder, flashes of lightning, a whirlwind, and the earth is shaken. Why? Because God is coming to save his people. And this kind of poetic license about the crossing of the Red Sea is found also in Psalm 114, very similar kinds of imagery. In the, the hymn in Habakkuk chapter 3, toward the end of, the, of Habakkuk, and in Psalm 18, verses 1 to 19, which is a story of God coming to rescue the psalmist, breathing fire and smoke out of his nostrils, mm-hmm. and parting the water by the breath of his mouth. It is imagery, right? The point is, in these theophanies, when God comes to save his people, he rescues them out of the waters of chaos, which are engulfing them. So you've gone beyond a literalistic idea of the Red Sea crossing. And you've gone to know the sea becomes a metaphor of the chaos that's engulfing God's people that God wants to rescue them out of. And if I had time, I would go into these texts, Psalm 114, Habakkuk 3, Psalm 18, and others, and show they're actually terminological links, words used in that are common to all these psalms, and the themes are there. Like you say, they're there in the air, right? They're there in, in the Baal myths or in the Iliad and so on. Mm-hmm. But the psalm is probably a drawing on a, a communal reservoir of imagery that they actually use. And some psalms may de- be dependent on others. In fact, you can actually find parts of a one psalm that are verbatim in another psalm. Mm-hmm. Like, like they were quite fa- fine quoting Peter. This, this is useful for my prayer. Let me stick it in my, my part now, right? Mm. We no, we do that. Yeah, go in, ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say, in just to tie this for modern people who are kind of getting lost in the whole ancient imagery, we do this in modern prayer. It, you, prayer is learned behavior, and if you are, th- there's a reason that people in churches their prayers tend to sound a little bit alike, or they use the stock phrases. Now. We, you know, you can tease it and talk about the people that say, oh, Father, Lord, God, Father, God, we just thank you, Father, God, for Lord, yeah. God, just, you know, Always like that. Just, yeah, keep just, just, just Lord, we just, yeah, just, yeah. just, yeah, yeah. but there are other phrases that pop up. I think of like people praying for traveling mercies. Yes. Nobody yes, knows yes. what that means or a hedge of protection. <laughs> right, but right. these, w- when you hear that, 
and you're a Christian, you know that there it's prayer and it's referring to, you know, giving me safe travel or protecting yeah. me from right. whatever. So we have these same things. They're just not as cool as they were in the Old Testament. Right. They're not as impressive. You know, your voice thundering, arrows and lightning, uh, the sea writhing. These are the same kind of thing. It's stock imagery. It just sounds way cooler than hedges of protection and traveling mercy. Right, right, right. <laughs> but but he apply, he's applying it to his own experience. I think mm -hmm. the, whole, the whole reason why the psalmist re remembers the crossing of the Red Sea this way is that he experiences his life as being submerged into chaos, and he can't find a way out. And so the waters are a perfect symbol for that. So he's not focusing on God's defeat of Pharaoh's army. Mm -hmm. He's focusing on how God made a path through what seemed to be an impenetrable dead end for Israel. Israel faced the waters and couldn't get through, and God parted the waters. So that's the brilliance of the psalm. And it's here that the world of the psalm can intersect with the world of the interpreter. Because uh, what I learned from the psalm is, is if I find myself in an analogous situation, instead of focusing on times when things are going well, which can lead to further negativity. And we wonder why things have taken a turn for the worse. And that's been my experience of being up at 3 a.m. Mm. with insomnia. If I call to mind instead the big picture, the meta-narrative, the biblical story of what God has done for Israel at the Red Sea or beyond that, or in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the new life forged by Messiah through death into a new, new creation. The key point is that my life is determined by the larger story that I inhabit. So if you forget the mighty deeds of God, you lose your way in life. I love the British like to say, we lose the plot. Mm. You've lost the plot. Mm. But if you remember the plot of the biblical story, then you can put yourself into that story. And calling the larger narrative to mind, meditating, remembering on what God has done, can be transformative and life-giving. It's really cool when we see the biblical narrative as as our story as our history uh, and i think that's only possible because through christ we've been adopted into the family of god and now if you are in christ you are abraham's seed and heir to the promises so we can look at this and we can see we can start to see how israel's story we fit into it and yeah. and it gives us I think you, your presentation is doing a great job in saying the stock imagery that Israel used, they used it because it was their story and because it had such powerful resonances with what they were experiencing. Exactly. And the depths and the deep, it there's, there's this, the deep is overwhelming. I mean, you can't overemphasize in the mind of the ancient, the deep was utter terror. Uh, I, you know, I've said before, we, we live in the post Jacques Cousteau age <laughs> where we can see what's going on under the ocean and we can see the pretty fishes and, you know, the intricate coral. And we we can visually see the beauty of the ocean in a way that the ancients couldn't. It was utterly terrifying for them, especially a non seafaring people like the Israelites. Mm -hmm. And and so when you're at the mercy of the sea. There are fewer images that can strike more terror yeah. than uh, an engulfing flood. You know, images of the tsunami in Indonesia or Japan, and that—I mean, that's that is just right. terrible. Hurricanes in Florida, I maybe mean, it's coming very close to us. You know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When when yeah. when Mother Nature rears her head, it can be you. You yeah. feel there are few things that make you feel more insignificant than something like that. And I think the psalmist using that—it's a great analogy. It's a yeah. great metaphor for whatever that's that's the, that's what's so cool is it can apply to so many different situations and so many different lives well so now we come to the the last piece so you want to, you want to yes i was going to say how so how does this psalm end so okay we're going to look at verses 19 20 the last two verses your way is through the sea you know bayam darcheha derek is way you know your way was through the sea ushavircha bemaim rabim and your path through the mighty waters yet your footprints were not known. I think Robert Alter in his commentary points out that the phrase footprints not known 
is used in modern Hebrew today when there's um, a fugitive on the run. <laughs> we don't know where he's gone. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, which is kind of hilarious when you think of it. But that's not the point here, right? <laughs> um, I think the point for the psalmist is, even though the way was blocked, no matter how impenetrable the chaos seemed, God made a way. And they couldn't even see God. They couldn't even see his footprints. So God's leading, even back then, was mysterious. And the psalmist says, you know, that's my experience too. I can't see God. I don't know where he's to be found. But if he could lead the people through the mighty waters, maybe it's going to be applicable to my life. So he, he ends by saying, yet you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. And then he ends. Those are the last words of the psalm. And I have to admit that when I was studying this psalm, when I was just reading it, first of all, and read it right to the end, I was a bit taken aback because this seems like a very abrupt ending. All right. God led his people through the sea. Did this memory impact the psalmist in any way? Did it help him? He doesn't actually tell us. So I think that the psalmist was hoping that God would take him by the hand as he led Moses and Aaron by the hand, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and lead him through his darkness and chaos to the other side. But he doesn't tell us this in so many words. He doesn't actually connect the big story to his own experience. So the psalm felt unfinished, and it still feels unfinished to me. Mm -hmm. I've come to the conclusion that this is not simply a matter of my personal perception. At the formal level of Hebrew poetry, the psalm is incomplete. Most of the psalm, like most Hebrew poetry, um, consists in paired lines. We call that um, bicola two lines that are sort of parallel to each other. And this psalm, up to verse, um, it would, I think it would be up to verse 14, 15, up to verse 15, yeah, is in bicola with one exception. One, There's one um, set of tricola, three paired lines earlier on in the psalm. But starting with the theophany, verse 17, you have tricola, you have three lines. So for example, the water saw you, they saw you, they writhed, indeed the deeps quaked. That's a tricolor. The dark, dark clouds poured out water. The clouds gave their voice. Indeed, your arrows flew. The voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Lightnings lit up the world. The earth quaked and trembled. Your way was through the sea. Your path through mighty waters, yet your footprints were not known. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Where's the third line? He left out the third line. It is formally incomplete. I think that Psalm 77 is intentionally unfinished so that we, the readers, can write our own conclusion. We can apply this magnificent vision of God making a way for ancient Israel to our contemporary life situations. But this is going to really require zakar and siach, remembering and meditating on the story mm -hmm. and its significance. We live in a very fast-paced age where you we, we don't read scripture carefully and slowly. When you read Hebrew or Greek, it forces you to slow down a little bit, unless you're totally fluent, and I am not totally fluent. You gotta slow down and take time to savor the meaning of the text. It is too easy, as a friend of mine put it, a friend from Puerto Rico, who's a biblical scholar too, it's too easy to do a quick drive-by, admiring the landscape from a distance of scripture. But get into the car, Go for a walk through the text. Go on a pilgrimage mm -hmm. through the amazing pathways of the text. Um, it's interesting. The, um, I think it's John Muir, the, the famous environmentalist, talked about sauntering um, through the wilderness. And the word saunter, he says, comes from the Middle Ages and people are going on in the Crusades to the, to, to, to the Holy Land. They say, where are you going? I'm going Santere. That means Holy Land in Latin. Mm -hmm. And Santa Rey became, I'm going to saunter. I'm going on a pilgrimage. Let's go on a pilgrimage through Scripture, taking our time, sauntering if you need to. I memorize this psalm in, in Hebrew. You know, and I pray it as my own prayer to God. And I envision the psalmist's description of how God comes to save and guide as applicable to my own life. So it led me to wonder how the psalmist would have liked to have ended the psalm. And I can't know. But then I thought of how I would conclude this psalm. Mm -hmm. And my conclusion is, I'll give you the Hebrew first and the English. Ulai oti el yabasha tenahel. Perhaps you might lead even me to dry ground. That's how the psalm makes sense of my life.
I love the fact, and this is something that you, you would probably not pick up just reading it in one English translation, certainly, but even in multiple is how abrupt the ending is and how I think you I think you make a good point. And, you know, I'm no Hebrew linguist. I have enough to muddle my way through the text, but it is very clear what you're talking about with three lines, three lines, three lines, and then two. That's a great, that, that that's the fun of Hebrew poetry and other books too, but, but mostly poetry that does this is it invites this give and take with the reader. It invites, I think when we, when you go to poetry, whether it's the prophets or whether it's the psalmists or even some of the wisdom, when you go to poetry looking to build theology, you're, you're kind of, you're, you're putting the cart before the horse or you're, you're, you're approach, you're not using the tool in the way that it was intended to be used. And when I say building theology, I don't mean constructing your view of God. I, I mean, forming doctrines, which is what a lot of systematic theologies and even a lot of apologists and a lot of popular level presentations they do with poetry. They, they proof text from the poets. That's crucial though, because you can build theology from poetry, but not by proof texting, but by understanding the overall poem, what its theology is, how it helps us, you know, develop our own theological perspective, but it's not by proof texting. Mm -hmm. That's something that I, I hope people can see through this little walk through this psalm is uh, because you do this in your writings on Job in Abraham's silence. You did a really good job of this uh, dealing with Job, which is all poetry, is how it, it's not you can't isolate even even a passage of where the speaker is like the good guy, like, right, Job, you've got a bunch of speakers saying stuff that's clearly not godly, even though it sounds godly. But we know because God says at the end, they didn't speak what's right. But even some of the stuff that Job says, if you pull it out in isolation, you're going to miss the message of what the book as a whole is trying to give. And so with the Psalms, it's it's that way as well. And I think this is a great example of that. It, it, land the plane for us, so to speak, right? We've got Psalm 77 and somebody watching this, if they've watched this far, maybe they're thinking, okay, it's a lot of new ideas. It's a lot of, I know more about Hebrew poetry and, and Hebrew grammar and stuff maybe than I did before, but can you, can you sum it up the meaning and the importance of this Psalm for you, Richard Middleton, and then how it might impact or resonate with the average person who's not a biblical scholar and who is just beginning to grasp the history and the story of God's people, what would this psalm say to them? It would say to them, I, I can reiterate that the psalm moves through an initial time of meditation upon God that is despairing, a second meditation upon the good old days, which is also despairing, a reflection upon the larger story of what God has done, open-ended. If you put yourself into that experience and read the psalm and think about how it applies to your own life, you will see some meaning for yourself. Um, generally, I can say that lament psalms teach us that we ought to be able to be honest with God and take what we have to God in the hope that there will be a response. But this psalm is even if God doesn't give a response directly, if you take it upon yourself to reflect upon Scripture and the meaning of the text for your own life, perhaps it can lead you out of the chaos of life and put you on solid ground again. Mm. Well said. I, I, the, the part that I think was the most uh, comforting to me in this psalm, interestingly, is that last little bit next to last, your footprints were not known. And how we, and I say we, meaning primarily North American evangelical Christians, which is my tradition, we want when God answers and shows up, we want it to be the storm. We want it to be the theophany. We want it to be the tangible, the, the, <clears throat> we, just, we, we want it to be the, something that we can point to somebody else and go, see, there it is. And a lot of time, I think most times, at least in my own life, when I look back, when I look back and confidently say that was God and that was God and that was God. Another outside observer would go, but, 
where's God? That's just this circumstance and this circumstance. But it's like, I, I'm seeing yeah, his footprints aren't known. He's not leaving his footprints, but he made the way through this chaotic engulfing waters. And, and, and I, I know it, I can't prove it to somebody else, but for me, it's, it's more than enough for when the doubts and the chaos and the engulfing flood does start to seem insurmountable. Well, I really appreciate you coming on and just talking about a, a psalm for over an hour. You don't get to do this in a lot of churches, and I don't see this done a lot on YouTube. So I wanted to, I wanted to change that and, and give people kind of a, I would say this more of a savory meal, a, a long four course, five course meal. <laughs> Is there anything that we did not cover that you want to leave with before we end? Sure, there's something we didn't cover, but I don't remember. <laughs> we didn't. What do you mean? Of course, we exhausted everything. There's no stone left to unturn. <laughs> uh, Richard, thank you so much for taking time. I know you have to get busy grading papers and doing academic professor stuff, which you're so familiar with by now. But for those who are new, maybe they didn't catch our last discussion and, and they're just starting to check out your work or are interested in checking out your work. Where can they find you? How can people reach you? Or how can people engage with the stuff that you're doing and putting out there? Well, one of the ways you can, you can engage me or see what I'm doing is to go to my website, which is just simply jrichardmiddleton.com. No periods in there, just the dot alone. And you can find a list of the books I've published there. If you go to the menu, you can find that. You can find PDFs of almost every article I've written. And I happen to have written two blog posts in the last week, which is unusual. So I've got back into it. And one of them was on, as we talked about at the beginning of this session, on deconstruction and reconstruction of faith. If you want to read that, stimulate your thinking. You can, you know, put comments and respond to me. And the comments come straight to my email. And I'm interested. And I'll respond to you. And do you, are there any books on the horizon? Or are they still in the beginning stages or the working stages? So the book on First Samuel that I'm working on um, called Portrait of a Disgruntled Prophet, Samuel's Resistance to God and the Undoing of Saul. Mm -hmm. um, but right after that, perhaps within the next year after that or less, I'm going to do a total rewrite of the first book I ever wrote on a Christian worldview, probably going to be called Shaped by God's Story. Mm -hmm. And then following that, I'm going to do a popular version of my book on Imago Dei, my liberating image book. I'm going to do a popular version of that. And then I got a couple more books to do. One on the Garden of Eden story and a, a, re, a short reader's guide to 1 Samuel. And a few others coming up after that, too. But that's you know, going three or four years into the future. Of, of the making of books, there is no end, indeed. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I, keep I, I, making them. Uh, I appreciate them. I know a lot of other viewers out there do as well. So, guys, if you are not already uh, following Richard's work, definitely I'll put links to his website in the description. Check out his articles. And I'll also put uh, links to a number of the books in the video description as well so that you can follow up. And the purpose of these interviews at Disciple Dojo is to get biblical scholarship, academic rigor, uh, the stuff, the cool stuff that's going on that may be tucked away at academic conferences sometimes to get it out in and in front of people. And so Richard, thank you. Thank you so much for coming and for being a guest here again at the dojo. You're welcome here anytime on any subject you're ever working on. If you just call me up and say, Hey, let's have a discussion on this. Cause I just came across it. And I want to talk about it. I'll be happy to do it. You're always welcome here. Thank you. Jay. It's been a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate the work you do with the dojo too. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much. And, 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 and again, I want to express face to face sort of through technology to you. I do appreciate your, uh, taking me under your wing at SBL, you, you and Carmen, a couple others, but you in particular made it, uh, probably 10 times the experience that it would have been had I just showed up and you not be in there. So that means a lot to me. And, uh, I, I really do thank you for it. And I look forward to many other ways that Disciple Dojo and the work of Dr. J. Richard Middleton can continue to coalesce and, and uh, you know, advance the kingdom. So again, I want to thank Richard for coming on and spending the afternoon talking to us. There's so much more that could be said, not just about this psalm, but about the psalms in general, Hebrew poetry, all of that stuff. 
but it's too much to cover in one episode. So what I encourage you to do, check out the links below to Richard's work. He is producing some of the most thought-provoking and profound biblical scholarship out there. There's a reason his sessions at SBL were so well-attended and enjoyable. He's someone I look up to as a scholar and who I am grateful to call a friend. So go check out his work. And if you missed his first appearance here in the dojo, be sure to check that out as well. We had just as good a time in that discussion as we did in this one. All right. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your support of Disciple Dojo. We'll see you back here next time. Take care.